to see that movie. <laughs> right? That's what it felt like. It's like, going to be a good movie. That's going to be a good movie. Man, welcome to Declaration. Welcome home, everybody. Let's just give everyone a hand who's joining us from online. Let's welcome them as well, can we? I think I saw one of my dearest and closest friends here somewhere. Is Kevin here? Oh, he went to the potty. Good. <laughs> Always had good timing. Well, yeah, Kevin's here. Today is my son's 18th birthday, everybody. Can you believe that? <laughs> Makes me feel a little old, but it's okay. I was going to crack a joke, and I was like, no, that's not going to come out right, so I'm going to leave that alone. It's good to be here, good to be here. Well, we began last week, um, well, actually, before I get in, I do want to remind you, Growth Track starts again today. I nearly forgot, I nearly forgot. It's going to be an incredible time. If you would like to learn more about Declaration, how you can get in, how you can get connected, um, check out Growth Track. It's not just about how you can connect into the church, though. It's really about how God has created you, how he has uniquely wired you. You're going to learn a lot about yourself in our growth track. And so that starts immediately following the service. It's in room 101. Um, we'll hang out with your kids for you while you're doing it. So it's really going to be an easy peasy thing for you to get a part of. We would love for you to do that. So go check that out. All right. Let, you guys ready to dive in this morning? I got about two hours worth of content to get in 20 minutes. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> well, we began last week with this pivotal passage that I believe um, is really important to us as a church. It's important for a lot of reasons. I want to go back to it this morning. Uh, we come to this passage often to remind us of some things. There, you know, in this passage, I think we find a few things. We find some vision that we have here at Declaration for every person that God gives us the privilege to walk with um, in this one passage. We also find uh, in this passage, in this verse, um, well, a little over two years ago, God began to speak through this verse in a different way as well when combining it with another passage in the book of Genesis. I'm going to take you there in a minute and remind you. But um, he used this verse to really kind of capture our hearts and I think our imaginations and give us some really big vision for this city. You know, we believe um, it's, it's in spring as it is in heaven, and we are the carriers of that hope, right? And so this verse God used to kind of catalyze some vision um, and that's when we began to launch this thing that we called the Movement Initiative. Now, you've heard me talk about this if you've been a part of Declaration for even a season. Maybe you weren't here back when we talked about it. It was a little over a year and a half ago, but you've heard me say it. You've heard us refer to it. Today, I want to catch you up because there's a lot of new families that have joined into the family since we did Movement. And so I want to catch you up. We are actually starting to do this when COVID hit. And I was like, you know what, we, we, need, we need to switch gears very quickly and just, um, you know, meet the moment, if you will. And so we're coming back to it. But this verse is Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. I want to show it to you in the message. It's what we looked at last week briefly. It says, if people can't see, if they can't perceive and see what God is doing, then they're going to all over themselves. They're going to have clear direction because they don't have clear vision. They don't have clear sight. Maybe your translation says, without a vision, People perish. Maybe you've heard that if you've been a part of church at any point in life. You know, I used to, when I spoke to students, mostly I would always start with this, like, yeah, um, I, I had a drug problem when I was a child. My parents drugged me to church my whole life, right? That's what I would say. And, and literally, and so I heard this verse quite a lot, quite often. And it really wasn't until, um, you know, God had me really study into it until I really began to understand it and God kind of gave me fresh revelation with it. Um, because a lot of times I would hear it and it'd be like, hey, without an idea of what we're going to do together, then we're all going to me be messed up. A little bit, but, but really it's without a, a revelation from God. Maybe another translation says without a, pro a prophetic word from the Lord. Without sight, clarity and sight and perspective, then we're going to stumble all over ourselves. But then it says, but when we attend to what God reveals to us, when we when we honor, when we step into obedience to what God reveals to us, it says that we're going to be most blessed, meaning most joyfully satisfied, all right? So does everybody kind of have an understanding there of what Proverbs 20 and 18 is saying? I think that in this life, we got to have spiritual eyes in order to perceive or to see what God is doing. Now, this can happen in a lot of different ways. The best way we can see what God is doing is found right here by being in his word, 
Listen, this is where God is going to give us the fresh revelation. Maybe sometimes it's going to come through a prophetic word or a prophecy. Can I tell you this? A prophetic word or prophecy will never contradict this word. God is not going to give you some new extra sequel to the Bible through somebody, okay? And I'll also say this. It's not to tear you down, but more so, it's really a prophetic revelation. It's supposed to build you up. It's supposed to encourage you. That is the biblical definition of a prophetic word. So, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to get some revelation many different ways. Prayer is one way. Every single way that we're going to see what God is doing is going to be rooted in his word, and it's going to really be something that's edifying to us. It's going to encourage us. Exhort us. Henry Blackaby. Anybody ever heard of Henry Blackaby? He's got a very famous, incredible Bible study and book that he wrote called Experiencing God. I highly recommend it. We offer it often through our small groups. It is something that every person who claims Jesus should go through at least one time. It's powerful because here's the truth of the matter. We can learn a lot about God and we can know a lot about God by our reading. But you know when when the difference is really made in your life is when you experience God, when you encounter God. So Henry Blackaby has this theosis, if you will, and here's what he says. He's, it's this, this big, bold idea of the whole thing. It's look where God is moving and join him there. Look where God is moving and join him there. That means we, we always have to be moment ready. We always got to be on alert. We always have to remain, abide with the Lord, walk with God, live yielded to Holy Spirit, listening for where the Holy Spirit is leading us and, and, and guiding us, living fully surrendered to Jesus making ourselves available to him each and every day. Leaning into passages like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, with everything that you are, basically. Don't lean on your own earthly wisdom or understanding, but in every way, acknowledge him, lean into him, abide with him, and he will direct your path. He will give you the clarity of sight so that you won't stumble around in the darkness. He will give you a most blessed, satisfied life. And this is really what I believe God desires for me and for you, for us, for everyone. This is what I believe God wants. That we would walk with him so passionately that we can see spiritually. I'm going to tell you something. Your physical sight will, um, (laughs) it'll mess with you sometime. I mean, just, just think about it. Look around right now. And if we just go by what we can only see in the physical, man, we're, we're deeply discouraged. So we got to lean into the, what, Lord, what the Lord's doing so we can see what he's doing. we got to walk with him to see spiritually. We've got to live humbly, faithfully, obediently, um, that our lives would be blessed by him, but also in turn, listen, that we would be a blessing. So nearly two years ago now, nearly two years ago, we launched this thing called the Movement Initiative, and it's really a disciple initiative. It's a discipleship thing is what it is. It it, it was something that called us as a church, as as the people of God, followers of Jesus. It called us to to, um, really evaluate the depth of our faith, the depth of our, our being a disciple, if you will. It challenged our priorities in a really big way. Anybody, I mean, if you were here in that moment, did you find some challenge that God did through the movement, that that series? Anybody? Like two of you, good. Well, me too. Okay, good. I'm going to preach a little harder now. Um, it did. It challenged our. Pro- it challenged us to, about. It, here's the thing. It challenged us in how we spend our time. It challenged us in how we look at how we spend time, how we're serving um, God. Are we serving God in His kingdom, or are we serving myself and mine? It challenged even how we steward the resources that God has entrusted to us. It might have even challenged our paradigm of how we view our resources, our finances, our money. As we say, you know what, guess what? It's really not ours. In and of ourselves. it's really not about us. Everything we have is from God. It challenged even our paradigm. See, we believe that the heart of movement was really about challenging us as to where our heart really was. Now, Scripture says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, you've probably heard this passage. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. This passage right here, I need you to know, is specifically talking about possessions and money. Possessions are not a bad thing. Money is not a bad thing unless it possesses you. And that's what this passage is talking about. It's talking about possessions and money. It's instructing us not to give our heart 
over to this earthly kingdom, but rather to the kingdom of God. Because see, where our treasure is, that is where our heart is also found. Where and how we steward the treasures that God has entrusted to us is a mirror of what's really going on inside. It's a mirror. It holds up a mirror. We got to have the right perspective of what treasures are and of their real value because scripture encourages us. Um, Let me give you the new living. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Or in the Amplified, I like this. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, and that on which your life centers will be also. See, this call of a deeper level of discipleship was incredible as we were challenged to give back to God in every way as part of how we worship him. That's why when we talk about giving, we, we, we align it with worship. Um, there's a statement, or there's a story, I think it was General uh, Sam, uh, Sam Houston, who when, when he came to know Jesus and was being baptized, he went up to be baptized, and he didn't put on the baptismal robe or anything. He, he wore his, his uniform, he wore his coat, he wore his boots, he had his, his weapon, and he had his wallet. And they said, well, General, do you want to put these things down? He says, no, you need to baptize that too. Well, General, how about your wallet? No, you definitely need to baptize that as well. See, that's the thing where we kind of get tripped up in the modern day churches. We want to kind of approach God as if he's the great God buffet where we want to take the things that we want, but we want to keep the things that we want too. And when God, when, when God baptizes us, when we, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, we don't just surrender some. Now, you know, Christians don't, they, they don't really say a lot of lies, but they sing them sometimes. That I surrender all. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> right? Right? Wherever your treasure is, that's where the desires of your heart will be. So, so movement's really this, this deeper level of discipleship and it challenges, challenges us of how we're giving back to God in every way. You know, it's part of how we worship. It's our response. Um, things like um, being generous to God with our time, with, our, with the talents that he gives us. Man, I believe that God can take the, God, he, he can, he can take the talent that he's given you and anoint it, and it will literally, it will change atmospheres. In fact, that's what we prayed for this morning is that there would be a fresh anointing of God that would pour out on this house today. Man, I hope that you came ready to receive today. Come on, somebody. That we pray that, that God would pour out this fresh anointing on you today and take the talent that he's given you and anoint it so that you could be a world changer. It's also about our treasures, the money that he gives to us, that he, he trusts and trusts to us. See, in other words, choosing to be more intentional is how we choose to use our time with how we choose to use the talents and, and, and the treasures that he gives us, considering the kingdom of God first and foremost rather than this earthly kingdom. Also, choosing to sacrificially serve others because of our love and our gratitude back to God. It's really just about how we respond to God day in and day out, day in and day out. And lastly, movement was about choosing to surrender our resources to God completely, to choose to give to God first in every way from a place of rather than last thoughts. Come on, somebody. First, through, first fruits rather than last thoughts. Or even thinking percentages. You know, um, a lot of times uh, as God has challenged me in, in, in my life and, and me and Kelly, especially in the area of giving, I've often, I've often felt convicted sometimes that I didn't give to God, I tipped God. Like, hey, thanks, thanks God, I'm, I, I, I'll throw you a bone. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I'm not even talking about tithing. No, I'm tipping. And, and, and the mark of a disciple, the one that follows the Lord, is the one that says, yes, and I love doing that. It is one of my favorite recreational hobbies and activities. But you know what? I'm going to forego that today. I know that God is calling me to serve in this. It means, you know what? Yes, I want that new thing, and things are not bad. They're just bad gods. And so I feel like the Lord is calling me to really give to this right now. But if I give to this, I can't buy that. So therefore, I'm going to wait to buy that, and I'm going I'm to serve God, and I'm going to give to this, and then I'm going to wait and see if God would have me to have that. Because watch this. You cannot outgive God. If God wants you to have that, that's going to happen. 
It's part of movement. We prayed and we encouraged for 100% of this body to engage in some way, whether that meant for the first time somebody was beginning to join this journey of generosity, even by saying, you know what, I don't know how I feel about this. Here's what I do know. I feel like every time I go to church, all they do is talk about money. Can I tell you this at Declaration? It is not my heart. We don't need your money because God provides everything that we need. Now, he uses us. That's how he provides, because he's entrusted it to us. And then it's really a matter of if you're going to be obedient to God or not. But I never never sit in stress about, I don't even look to see who's giving what and when. I don't look. I don't. You know, the only thing I've asked Shannon, who, who handles a lot of our business stuff, is I've said, hey, let me know if you see something I need to know about, something dramatic, and here's why. Is here's what happens when we say, hey, we're going to come and be a part of this family. We're going to come and we're going to serve Jesus in this house, whether it's whatever house you choose. We will come in with our feet, but we will sit down with our giving. When we choose to disengage from God in the house, we will begin to disengage with our giving, and then we will do it with our feet. So I said, Shannon, just let me know if there's anything I need to know. Because I trust that God is going to take care of his house. It's not my house. It's his house. We can say it's our house because it's home and we want to say welcome home. But the real perspective is it's God's house. And watch this. We are God's bride. Can I tell you something? If that woman right there asks me for anything, I will do whatever I can to give it to her. Whatever I can. Now imagine to eternity infinite scale how God must feel about his bride whatever his bride needs he will provide for amen and so I want you to hear my heart on this as we talk about things like movement and and how you're stewarding the time that God has given you because check it out every time there's another there's another second ticking somebody says yesterday they're like how you feeling how you doing I said I'm doing good I'm feeling pretty good um Closer to death today than I was yesterday, but I'm feeling pretty good, you know? (laughs) It's a true story. How are we stewarding our time? How are we stewarding the resources God has given to us? We don't want to be on autopilot. We want to think and consider. We We want to honor God in what we're doing and how we do it. I got off my notes, so let me figure out where we're going to go here. Let's go back to Proverbs 29. We're able to see God's vision clearly and walk in obedience, which leads us to blessing when we yield and when we surrender, when we walk with God. Now, here's the thing. A year ago, um, when this entire globe thought, oh, man, the year 2020, how cool, 2020 vision, you know, <laughs> it's going to be so good. You know, we all sat in January. We we're like, no, I don't, I don't need a word from the Lord this year. I don't even need a resolution because I'm going to have 2020 vision, right? <laughs> Hashtag. Uh huh. That did not work out for a lot of us. <laughs> we were met with some crazy challenges, and we're still obviously in it, man. I mean, we're still, some of us are in a real season of struggle, right? I, I know so many of you that I'm praying for nearly every day because you're still furloughed, you've lost jobs. It's a struggle. It is a struggle. And so, you know, here's the challenge that we face in the shadow of COVID is I believe that God has really used these last seven months to really shake things. Now, listen, I think this is biblical, and I want to show you why. Understand, we we can choose a perspective of when God shakes things as being a negative thing or a positive thing, but we have to know this. When God shakes things, it's a biblical thing. It's a biblical thing, and it's usually for a certain thing. Like when Peter and John, they're captured, and they stood before the Sanhedrin, and they're standing before the religious leaders, and they're answering to preaching in the name of Jesus. That's what they're answering to. The religious leaders command them, do not speak or teach in the name of Jesus ever again. So what did Peter and John do? Well, they go back to all the other believers and hang out. They report all that had just happened, and what do they do? They begin to pray. And as they prayed, they prayed for even more boldness to continue to preach because they knew the word of God was like a fire in their bones. They would be weary of holding it in. The only logical response to what they had seen and encountered with God was a yielded, surrendered life that would preach the truth of God. Didn't matter what people said. 
So they pray, God, give us even more boldness. And in verse 30, we see this. For they say, God, would you stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of Jesus? Which leads us to verse 31 in the book of Acts, chapter 4. It says this, and when they had prayed, watch what happens. The place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Or how about when Paul and Silas were, were beat and they were thrown into prison? for delivering a slave girl literally from a demon. And here they are, and they're singing, worshiping, they're praising in spite of being beat, in spite of being in prison. So they're full on in this posture of worship as they are praying and they're singing, and, and all these prisoners are watching and listening. And look what happens in Acts chapter 16, verse 26. It says, and suddenly there came a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison house were shaken. <laughs> And immediately, look what happens. When God shakes things, supernatural things occur. It says, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. See, when God wants our attention, when God wants to do something supernatural in us and through us, God will begin to shake things. Are you with me, somebody? Now listen, I'm, I, I was raised Southern Baptist, but I'm going to need you to... Good or you're not not so good, all right? <laughs> I know my mic's going in and out because the devil don't want you to hear what's going on today. And I believe that. Some of you are like, ah, oh, whatever, it's just bad technology. Nope, because two weeks ago when it went out, the unit was completely blocked. And when we took it back to the office, it turned on and worked perfect. It worked perfect last week. It worked perfect through setup and sound check. And when we got up to lead worship, guess what happened? It didn't work perfect. In fact, it didn't work at all. But I'm going to tell you right now, the enemy doesn't want for the supernatural things to begin to happen in your life as God is shaking things around your life. But I'm here to tell you, man, the enemy has lost the battle. Amen. What he meant for evil, God will turn for good, and he is going to use a real moment of struggle to shake things to basically bring a supernatural move to play. And the question is, is are we going to see it? Are we going to surrender to it? And are we going to serve him in it? That's the question. <laughs> Haggai chapter 2 verse 7. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. That is what I am praying for on the other side of this shaking. That God will fill this house with his glory. I'm going to need someone to say Amen. See, I truly believe this season that we've been in, where some would say it's a season of suffering, I'd say it's a season of sifting and shaking. God wants to do something supernatural, so he's shaking things to see what kind of true remnant will rise up and remain. Look what it says in Hebrews 12. The Bible talks about everything that can, will, everything that can be and will be shaken, and only the things that God wants to remain will remain. The season that we've been in is a shaking, it's a sifting to reveal the true remnant that will remain. So with this in mind, as we have been shaken and sifted, who is it that is seeing and truly discerning? Who is it that's heart is starting to beat a little faster and a little harder? What is God doing and, and, and responding with? Who is going to respond with this deep, continued, steadfast faithfulness to God, no matter how heavy and hard the shaking continues to shake? No matter how hard and suffering that we, that, that we end up enduring, the suffering we end up to enduring as the sifting is taking place. I mean, I'll just be real. It's very easy right now to cave into fear. In the shadow of COVID especially, it's very easy just to cave into fear. Here's the other thing that I've seen. Now that like, at least Texas is kind of, you know, uh, um, kind of, kind of uh, un undone a lot of the restrictions and we're kind of loose again. Um, how many of us have just decided to default back to business as usual? As if the last seven months of shaking never occurred. Just business as usual. See, in light of everything that's been going on as we begin this new important series, I believe, called Activate, I want to take you back to a key passage like the prophet.
9 that we just did because I want to give you context, the why behind the what. It's a passage that so encouraged my faith time and time again. It was on the forefront of my heart and in my mind when God called Kelly and me to launch this church to be church planners. It was so deeply instrumental when God um, gave us vision for a a future permanent campus, a permanent ministry center right here in this area. This, This passage has been so instrumental for so many of us. And I believe that God wants to really encourage some of us today, maybe in a new, fresh way, in a deeper way, a more radical faith kind of way. So let's look at Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 7 really quickly, and I'm going to put it in gear. Man, this time change has really messed me up. i got to really think about what time it is. What time is it? (laughs) We should be wrapping up pretty quick, right? All right, here we go. I'm going to have to give you part two next week. Is that okay? Will you come back? You better. I'm watching. I know everyone who's here. We've got cameras everywhere. (laughs) That means you too, Kevin. (laughs) Genesis chapter 12, 1. The Lord says to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I'm going to show you. He says, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family. Go to the land that I'm going to show you. That's what he says in the New King Jimmy. Verse 2, he says, if you do it, I'm going to make you a great nation. Somebody just got it. That's good. (laughs) He says, if you'll do what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great, and you're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you, and I'm going to curse those who curse you. And in you, every family on the entire face of this earth, every family under creation will be blessed. So he's saying, okay, Abraham. We see him as Abram right here. God hadn't said Abraham yet. Abram. He says, okay, Abram, leave comfort. Leave familiar. Leave fear. Leave friendships. Leave community. Leave safety net. Leave livelihood. That's what he's saying. He's saying, Abram, leave normal. Leave traditions. Leave your father, leave your father's family, which means, this represents a lot, right? Leave them, um, leave your inheritance, leave your status, leave your security. And Abram, I want you to go, and I want you to walk with me. I want you to trust me. I want you to leave everything behind and follow me to a place that I'm going to show you. I'm not giving you the coordinates, I'm not telling you where we're going. I'm just telling you to go. I'm making you a promise, Abram. But in order for you to receive the promise, you're going to have to go with nothing but my presence. You're going to have to leave the provision of your family, of your earthly father, and step into the promise of heavenly father. You'll have to leave comfort, choose calling. You got to leave faith. You got to leave, I'm sorry, fear. And you got to leave familiar and choose faith. You're going to have to go and activate faith. See, to stay is to say no. So just go. What is, what's it going to be, Abram? That's, that's what God's saying. Can I tell you this right now? That's Genesis 12. In the year 2020, in the year of our Lord 2020, October, which is sure to be a really crazy next 30 days. Come on, stop. God is saying, man, it's time to leave all this riffraff behind, as good as some of it looks to you, as appealing as some of it is. It's not so much attention and allegiance to the news and to the politicians and to the disease and the pandemics. And time to turn your affection and your attention and your allegiance back to the God who has all authority and is sovereign over the news and the politicians and the pandemics. Are you with me? It's time to go. Count the cost because it's going to cost you everything. When I used to speak to students about salvation, I would talk them out of it before into it because here's the deal. Our God is not the God you come to and give your life to and says, okay, good for you. Here's a Lamborghini. That's not the way life works. At least not mine. I've seen a few Lamborghinis and I thought, is this one mine, God? But sure enough, if I get in, I go to jail. 
No, really, if you come to Jesus, it's, you got to count the cost because it just might cost you everything. Everything you've counted on in the past, everything you know is familiar, that's comfortable, everything that you love, that you find so much value in, that you put so much trust in, that you, put, that you find so much security in, that you find hope in, things that you, know, that, that you look at and you're like, oh, you just get me. You just get me, Starbucks. I don't know. It's burnt to me, but whatever. <laughs> Count the costs. And, and think about the sifting and think about the shaking. Receive this promise, Abram. It's going to cost you everything, everything you've counted on. Man, you've got to activate your faith and go. But if you do, here's what I'm going to promise you, Abram. You're, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing to generations, for generations to come, every family on the face of creation will be blessed because of this step of obedience. Man, gosh, what if, what if the smallest step that God has invited us to take could cause a ripple effect that would literally change the world? But tra more tragic, what if we chose not to take that step? That moment when God is making your heart beat fast saying, go. Verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken took Lot with him. Abram's 75 when he departs. He's 75 years old. So what excuse do I have at 46? I don't. He takes his wife, Sarai, Lot, his brother's son, whatever possessions that they had, that they could gather, people they had acquired in Haran, and they depart and they go to the land of Canaan, the land of promise. They, they, they come into the land of Canaan. Abram passes through the land to the place of Shechem, it says, as far as the, actually, Shechem, that's what's, uh, yeah, sorry. As far as Terebinth, Tree of Moriah, and the Canaanites were there in the land. And it's, in verse 7, it says, then the Lord appears to Abram and says, to your descendants, I'm going to give this land. Hey, Abram, here it is. You've been faithful to follow me. You were faithful to activate your faith. Check it out. Look, look at that. Let your eyes see the promise. This is the land. This is it. I'm going to give this to all of your descendants. What if our faith step today is really not about this moment? What if the things that God is inviting us to partner with him today is about the future generations? If you've got a kid in the room, I want you to look at that kid for a second. Make good eye contact for a moment. Remember and think about it. Jaden's 18 today. Y'all, listen, I remember like it was yesterday, the day that he was born. It changed my life. It gave me so much perspective about just the majesty of God. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It absolutely changed everything for me in a single moment. The only other thing that changed my perspective, my mind, and my heart, and my life like it, hey, I married Kelly. I'm serious. It changed everything. I want you to look at your kid again, or just think about it. They're probably back there. If, if that's your kid screaming, God bless you. <laughs> but listen to me. Listen to me. What if, what if, listen, what if every faith step that God is inviting you and me to take right now doesn't touch anything? For us, What if it's just God saying, hey, look, I'm going to promise you what I'm going to do in that next generation. What I'm going to do through that next generation. What value can you put on that? Hey, listen, we got to end there today. I got a lot more to go, but we're on the clock and... They're going to start charging us overtime up in here. So I don't know if you know this, but this isn't really our church. It is a public school. <laughs> so, so can I pray for you today? Let me pray for you. Would you, would you. would you stand to your feet? I'm going to invite the team to come. And our, our, our team has been so faithful to give you communion elements, and so I want to go through that very quickly. It won't take long. Listen to me for a minute. Let's just leave. I really believe I want to do some supernatural in your life, in your family. And I believe that he's starting a new season right now. The question is, is 
Are you willing to take the ride? Getting to speak to us in deeper ways, to a deeper level of functionality, a deeper level of intimacy, a deeper level of obedience. Because he's got some incredible things. Incredible things on the flip side of this moment that we're in. And so man, I so want to encourage you because God is so for you. Gosh, he, lo- he is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over here. <laughs> he is. And he's got some incredible things for you. Don't let the enemy distract you. We're going to go. So, God, thank you for your goodness. God, thank you that you're calling us deeper places. God, in the shaking, you're inviting us into something supernatural. May we not miss it. God, may, may we get active in this moment to whatever it is that you desire. Maybe for some it's, it's to surrender their life to you for the very first time right now. They've held out long enough. Maybe for some, it's for those who've made, made some agreements with, with the devil who his, his mission statement for his existence is to destroy us. And so we're sitting here trying to figure out the science about you, God, when you're saying it's about the faith in me. And we're trying to debunk, demystify, but God, here's the truth. We need you to be so big and massive and mysterious. Otherwise, you're not worth serving as our God. And so I pray for a, just a supernatural gift of faith. Fall. We rebuke the agnostic thought, any atheist thought. Amen. Ask that you would activate the Spirit in so many lives right now. God, pour out the gift of salvation. Man, if you're in the house today and you've never surrendered to Jesus... The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord. So maybe you're like me. I remember being in a moment just like this, in a church like this, and I knew that God was saying, come to me. And I just said, Jesus, surrender. I believe you. I need you. I need forgiveness. I need freedom. And I want to be a friend of God. You're praying that with me right now. Jesus, I want you. I need you. I need forgiveness and freedom. I want to be a friend of God. Empty me of my past and make me somebody new. Keep going with me. Come on, Jesus. Empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit today, Jesus. Change me right now in this moment. You're my God of hope. Maybe some of you have run from the Lord. You've run from being faithful to God. But can I tell you, he's so faithful. He's waiting right here for you. And maybe in this next moment, you would turn around and realize you don't even have to run back to him because he's right there. So Jesus, meet us where we are in this moment. We pray. Activate our hearts again. Resuscitate us. Revive us. Renew us. Breathe fresh and anew, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we give the Lord a big hand clap today? I believe somebody was... If you will, we're going to have the team sing us out in just a second, but if you don't have these elements right here um, for some call this Eucharist, supper, the table, communion, if you don't have that, would you hold a hand up? We'd love everyone to be able to participate. We've got people right now, look there's some hands back there, Donald, if you see Kathy in the back. All the way in the back. Anybody need one? And as you take that and prepare, just ask. I want to, I just come before you. Point out anything you might find in me that would grieve you. Give me clean hands and pure hearts. Then I might be worthy of your table this morning. For those of you who have surrendered your life to Jesus, this is such a powerful, incredible moment for you. It is a picture of a day that will come when we are with the Lord Jesus in glory, when we will be at a banqueting table. 
It's a picture of the night before our Lord Jesus was crucified on our behalf to, to take away our sin identity. I'm going to show you. The wafer in there represents the bread, which represents the body of Christ. He was whole. We were broken, but he willingly and obediently allowed himself to be broken so that we could be made whole. This cup of juice right here represents the blood of Jesus. We call it the cup of salvation. He was full, but he willingly and obediently emptied himself so that we could be filled. So we come to the table with juice and bread, and we take and we eat and we drink, and we do, and we do the Bible says, we declare his death. We align our hearts and our lives with his death until he returns us again because he is coming back so if you will take that wafer and eat the body of Christ broken for you an appropriate response as you do is to say thanks be to God and then you can peel that next layer back and you can take and drink the blood of Christ spilled for you for your forgiveness and for your freedom and for your ability to have friendship with God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hey, let me tell you something before you go. Man, you are free. You are forgiven. Jesus, thank you for your kindness and your goodness. Thank you for this church. Thank you for each and every person in this house. I pray blessing and favor on them as they go today. God, we respond to you not with, not with anything but our lives today. Do in us and through us what you desire to do. May we be your hands this week. God, may we offer your heart this week to those in need. And may we love people the way you love people and serve them the way you serve them this week until you bring us back into this house to celebrate you and to worship you together once again. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, everybody, go in peace. Have such a great week. Real quick, if I just have a, a small moment of your time, man, I, I want to join in with God as, as He is inviting you to take that next step with Him. You know, for, for some of you, maybe you, you look around the world and you, you, know, you, you know that we're in the middle of an election, you know, the president has COVID now, the, there's wildfires going on, man, and the world can look broken and really leave you really hopeless. Well, if that's you and you, you want to know, you know, our last series was called Hope Again. And all of that starts with Jesus and just surrendering your life over to him. You know, and, and the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. And so if that is you, if you are feeling hopeless, man, jump in those comments. You know, send us an email. You can email us at, at, at prayer at declaration.org. And, you know, we would love to walk through that with you and walk through life with you. And, uh, you know, maybe for you, your next step is... You know, you're just, you're looking for a new church family. And, you know, whether you are in Spring, Texas with us or, or maybe you're just, you know, somewhere else in the world, we want to have community with you. And, you know, just a personal story with me, you know, small groups have meant so much to me and my wife. A lot of my best friends that I now have today have come through small groups. And, you know, as a Christian, small groups are vital. Community is vital. Even when you look through Acts, man, they, they broke bread together. They prayed together. They spent time together and through that they saw thousands come to know Jesus and man if, if that's you if you're looking for that community again hop in those comments reach out to us email us you can even go online to declaration.org and find a small group we have them going on right now and even if you're not in spring we have online small groups that you can be a part of man with, with that I just want to encourage you guys today that Man, God loves you. He is for you. Even in this, this craziness that, that's going on and, and throughout the whole world right now, God is for you. Man, and he has such a purpose and a plan for you. Man, but with that, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pray real quick and then we will, we will go about our Sundays. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, God. Thank you that even in the midst of craziness, God, that you are good, that you are for us, and that you love us so much, God, so much that... We can't even wrap our minds around it, God, but you just become such a, a wellspring of life for us, God. And thank you so much. Thank you so 
so much. God, I pray a blessing over every single person out there right now who's watching this stream, God, that they would just, man, they would just feel that, that extra warm hug that you have for them this morning. Lord, thank you so much for your generosity, God, for your, for your care, and just, Lord, for your mercies that are new every single morning. God, thank you so much for this day. And again, Lord, I just pray that you would bless everyone who's watching this stream right now. And God, that they would just be a blessing to others. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, thank you guys again for tuning in with us, and we will see you soon.